This 10th year of Daily Tech News show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you. That's you, Rodrigo Smith Zapata. You too, both of you, John and Becky Johnston, Chris Benito, not leaving you out. And everybody welcome in our new patrons, Michael and Mar Noodles. Delicious. On this episode of DTNS, why iMessage on Android's a bad idea. Apple CEO Tim Cook has a succession plan. And Robert Herron's here with gift ideas for home theater fans. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, November 21st, 2023. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from studio thinking about Thanksgiving already, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Home theater and TV calibration expert, Robert Herron. Welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Thank you for coming on a holiday week in the U.S. too. I, it's couldn't be better timing, honestly. I, I love yeah. this time of the year. It's really it's nice. Almost I mean, like this you is and the Roger week when a lot of people <laughs> just mysteriously stop responding. So it's always yeah. good. To have you. <laughs> Get the work done early. Especially now that off. Black Friday is an entire month. It's not even a single day. It's good to have. True you. that. All right, let's start with the quick hits. As we wait for yet more open AI news, here's what we've learned since yesterday's DTNS. The information reported that in an attempt to sway Anthropic CEO Dario Emodi to become CEO of OpenAI, the board of OpenAI proposed a possible merger between the two companies. Emodi declined. The information also says that the OpenAI board offered the position to Nat Friedman, the former CEO of Microsoft-owned GitHub, and also Alex Wang, co-founder and CEO of Scale AI, both declined. The Financial Times says that the percentage of staff who have signed on to leave OpenAI for Microsoft, unless the board resigns, has grown to 97% of all employees. Meanwhile, while OpenAI decides what to do with itself, Anthropic released Claude 2.1, its chat GPT competitor. Claude 2.1 can pay attention to more information at once than chat GPT with 200,000 tokens. It also promises better accuracy and can use apps and APIs. Ex-chairman Elon Musk has filed his lawsuit against Media Matters, an organization that issued a report last week that alleged corporate advertisements have also been appearing on pro-Hitler, Holocaust denial, white nationalist pro-violence, and neo-Nazi accounts. After the lawsuit was filed, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton announced that he also is opening an investigation into Media Matters. Both Musk and Paxton claim Media Matters created an account that only followed major advertisers and extreme content and then refreshed the feed in order to make the ads show up and imply that it was a common occurrence. Musk filed the lawsuit in Texas, where it will not be subject to rules that prevent retaliation over reporting, like California's anti-slap laws. Although bipartisan calls for a ban on TikTok have quieted as of late, U.S. concerns about issues over privacy and social media and the matter involving TikTok is not yet resolved. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen told CNBC, quote, we do have concerns about the potential issues with privacy and social media. She also added she can't discuss TikTok specifically, citing pending legal action that prevents U.S. regulators from acting. No, oh, ramp, ramping that one up again. Okay, that's a, that, play the hits. Uh, Firefox users have been reporting that some YouTube videos will take around five seconds to load, whereas on Chrome, those same users with those same videos see them load right away. Uh, some folks on Hacker News and Reddit dug into the code and found some snippets that indicate the delay might be because of an anti-ad blocker routine. It's unclear exactly what the code does, uh, and the problem is not easily replicated. Just because you have Firefox and YouTube with an ad blocker doesn't mean it's always causing that same delay. Google told Android Authority that some users with ad blockers installed, quote, may experience suboptimal viewing. Amazon launched its free AI ready program with the goal of training at least 2 million people by 2025 on basic to advanced AI skills. The training is centered on eight online courses that focus on generative AI and cater to both beginners and those who have a little bit more experience in this realm. The courses are free for all to access online through the Amazon Learning website. All right. 
Oh, we talked previously about nothing, uh, trying to bring you an app powered by Sunbird that would let you access iMessage on an Android phone. Uh, if you recall, it worked the way Beeper works. Uh, and there, there are other services that do this by putting Macs in the cloud that you then log into remotely and it would forward those messages to you. Uh, following nothing, removing that chat app based on Sunbird that we mentioned yesterday, Sunbird has now removed its own app from the Google Play Store. Uh, both of them are removed because of security questions. Here's what we know. Both 9to5Google and text.com found multiple security problems with Sunbird's implementation, such as Sunbird was logging and storing messages in plain text in its error reporting software, Sentry, and in a Firebase database. The tokens used to secure message delivery were sent over HTTP, not HTTPS, which made those tokens easy to intercept. Messages were not encrypted at rest in the Firebase database until the client read them, leaving them vulnerable to interception before they are read. So text.com was able to intercept one of those tokens and then use it to subscribe to the Firebase real-time database, which would notify them every time a message was entered into the database, making it trivial for them to access and read almost every message before they were encrypted uh, after somebody attempted to read them. All of this, of course, in violation of Sunbird's promise that all your messages are secure and end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, 9to5Google also looked into this and found that all the documents sent through Sunbird remained public because they were links to documents that were on a server that was public. Um, I think... You know, there's always a good side and a bad side to a story, Sarah, except maybe in this case. Yeah, I this can't. This just seems like a bad side. Can't find the silver lining here. Uh, when when we first reported on the story, I was like, this is great. I mean, not for everybody, but it's certainly uh, an interesting solution for a lot of people who. Yeah, the idea want, of it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah I want to get, you know, over that kind of blue versus green bubble thing, which is really quite silly, to be honest. But hey, some people really care. Uh, and at the time, I remember seeing, you know, some 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 chirping around around the internet of like, mm, I don't know, you know, how are they doing this? How is this being implemented? Um, Ars Technica noted in its article about nothing saying, yeah, we're, we're not going to do this anymore, that in their frequently asked questions on the website, uh, at least as of this recording, they still explain how everything and encrypted and you as a user should have absolutely no issue um, or any privacy concerns because nothing has you taken care of now obviously well not obviously but i'm going mm -hmm. to suppose that the company believed that was true and yeah. just did not do their own due diligence i don't think this is in some you know way supposed to be some like crazy nefarious way to you know see everybody's chats and and ruin the company's reputation going forward it's still a pretty big blunder, though. I believe companies like this, like Sunbird and Beeper, can make this work securely, but it requires a lot of assurance and a lot of trust. I tried Beeper and then immediately revoked its token because I just didn't feel comfortable having my Apple ID logged in on a terminal that I was not in charge of. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I still don't feel comfortable. And I have nothing against Beeper. I'm not even saying I don't trust them. I'm just saying, you know what? I just feel uncomfortable doing that. Yeah, I was, was feeling the same way about beyond. Sunbird, right? Yeah. yeah, it was one step beyond. And then someone goes poking around in Sunbird, like, how good is their security? And we find out it doesn't exist. It's it's just it's just not implemented. Uh, Robert, I know you were telling me before the show that you, you know Signal was was talking about just how expensive security is. Totally. They had a wonderful article that detailed that their estimated cost per year right now is about $50 million in order to make their entire ecosystem work for everyone around the world. And that includes end to end encryption, including file transfers. And uh, they even have a built in uh, money transfer system as well within their application. Granted, if the color of the chat bubble is what is driving you to these applications, then something like Signal may not appeal to you. But 
it's almost a proven at this point, uh, overly proven technology in terms of how well it's implemented in terms of personal security. And if that's the most important thing to you, that's where you really have to take a look at what these services are doing and maybe not jump on the bandwagon for the absolute latest one until it's until it's proven its worth, especially if your your communications are critical in terms of keeping them private between you and whoever you are communicating with. Uh, that's that's one thing Signal does very, very well. And they have proven time and again that if there's a problem, it's not their protocol. It's not their back end. They are experts practically in that field, pioneers, so to speak. Yep. And others others are, they'd like to just say they're doing that and doing it right. But it really does take a critical eye on the whole ecosystem to make sure it's all end to end and done properly. Yeah. But, uh, but it's that, I, that green versus blue, the yeah. chat bubble thing, though, yep. that amazes me. That how Apple, how important that is to so many people. Apple implementing RCS will help <clears throat> with some of this, but it's still going to be green bubble, blue bubble. So there's still going to be that psychology. Yeah. All right, Sarah, I'm I'm levitating at our next story. Ah, I bet you are. <laughs> Tim Cook appeared on Dua Lipa's At Your Service podcast for BBC Sounds. Now, Cook sitting down, they talked about a lot of sing- uh, things, but uh, Cook told the singer, uh, Dua Lipa, if you're not familiar, is a She's just lovely. Great. A lot of hits. Tim Cook said, we're a company that believes in working on succession plans. So we have a very detailed succession plan because something unpredictable can always happen. I could step off the wrong curb tomorrow. Hopefully that doesn't happen. I pray that it doesn't. Now, when Dua Lipa asked Cook who who was next in line, he said, well, I can't say that. But (laughs) I would say that my job is to prepare several people for the ability to succeed. And I really want the person to come from within Apple, the next CEO. So that's my role, that there's several for the board to pick from. I, if now, I were Tim could, Cook, I would have answered this differently. I would have said, don't start now. I've got new rules on who's going to succeed me in case I do a Houdini. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, well, it, it should have been you that she was interviewing, obviously, Tom. <laughs> but since it was uh, Tim Cook, I don't know. Nothing about this. I, I think you could jump to a conclusion like, is Tim Cook about to retire? Or, you know, is he sick? Mm-hmm, or, you know, all mm-hmm. sorts of, you know, that that's kind of, that, no, I'm not saying that's not true. What I think is, you know, whether he's going to be at Apple for another 25 years or another year or some, you know, somewhere in between the two. Of course, when you're Apple, you're going to have a plan B, C, D, E, F, and, you know, who even knows. I mean, there's no way that the company is like, well, if Tim goes, we're really screwed. Nobody will have any direction and we'll just shut down, you know, the spaceship and that'll be the end of that. Of course, a company is going to have succession plans. I mean, ha ha. Anybody who's seen uh, the series Succession knows that that can get kind of messy. But um, I don't really feel like Tim Cook is a Logan Roy in this situation. I think he's probably like, yeah, I mean, if it's not going to be me, who is it going to be? Just the same way that Steve Jobs pinpointed Tim Cook as his successor quite, a, quite, quite some years before yeah, yeah. Tim Cook actually became the successor. I, it makes me wonder if either of you have an idea of why address this, right? Because these interviews, uh, a lot of times the list of questions is vetted ahead of time. The question she asked was not, do you have a succession plan, but how long do you think you'll continue working? You're 63 years old, Tim. It's a fair question. Uh, And he took it and said, well, I hope to keep working for a long time, which is the answer you expect, and turned it into the succession uh, issues. So are there people out there concerned about this? And he wants to get the word out to say, hey, folks, don't worry. We, you know, I'm not going anywhere, but we've got a plan in case, you know, it's just, I just wonder what caused him to want to address this publicly. I agree with Sarah in the sense that he's stating the obvious for a, a trillion totally, dollar yeah. company. They are obviously uh, well prepared for any eventuality. I'm sure they have a playbook written down where if Tim just straight up loses his mind one day or just decides to that's it. I'm, I'm running out of the building and never coming back. That company would function just perfectly uh, and quickly. And uh, what to do exactly if if and when that ever happens. Chances are that is not going to happen. Chances are it will be a very, very detailed and uh, smooth transition for their next leader of the company. But Tim is still doing a fantastic job. I think according to anybody who follows that company, there is no rush in it. But maybe he has indicated within the company itself that, hey, you know what, I would like to 
get this yeah. ball rolling and make sure we're yeah. ready to go because I'm I would like to retire and enjoy a very successful end of this career and go do whatever the hell I want to do. Uh, that that all makes sense. To, you name and it. And within Apple, I would have no question about that. Why tell Dua Lipa though, is my question. Like why <laughs> make a point? You know what I mean? Like why make a point of saying, okay, I'm going to say this. It's going to make headlines. Uh, it, it, the only thing I can think of is he's 63 and is getting ahead of it and says, you know what, as I get closer to 65, a bunch of people are going to start asking this question. So let me just, let mm -hmm, me just answer mm -hmm. it before it starts getting asked. Well, especially because he, he, he went to um, the extent to say, and I really want to, that person to come from Apple itself. Yeah, now, yeah. Apple can change their mind sure. you know, that, you know, that he say whatever he wants, Ward but can do whatever it wants. Right. But assuming Ask that, Sam Altman. What, yeah, right. <laughs> Assuming that it would actually come from inside Apple to lay that foundation of, I mean, I, I don't know, um, is it Eddie cute? Like who, whoever it could be that mm -hmm. makes the most sense from within Apple to, to get everyone used to the idea of Tim Cook, you know, handing over the reins and maybe somebody taking on a little bit more of those CEO roles over the next few years that just makes especially the stock market chill out a little bit yeah it yeah. could be a seed planting function within the company itself just to make sure there's like hey be, be aware this mm -hmm. will happen sure. sooner than later uh yeah and think about Let's it start taking it seriously <laughs> yeah uh well folks if you're like uh enough apple already is your iMessage thing and your tim cook thing why can't you talk about Android more? Well, we can, and we will. And we have an entire show devoted to it as well called Android Faithful. Every week, our friends, Ron Richards and Huen Tui Dao, uh, and, uh, and a lot of their friends bring you the latest Android news and information. You can watch it live. Tune in Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, or subscribe to the feed and enjoy it whenever you like at androidfaithful.com. Well, on last Friday's show, Will Smith shared a great selection of gift suggestions for the holiday shopping season with an emphasis on the geek in your life. This week, we're getting electronically specific because it's a great time to see what the best deals are for home theater shoppers and gifters this season. Robert Heron, nobody is better to talk about this than you. You always bring the knowledge. So where do we begin on the gift guide? I want to buy somebody a TV. Where do I start? Let's start with the very best in eye candy for 2023. And that really has become the OLED displays that are available right now, the organic light emitting diodes. These TVs deliver that perfect black, that incredible contrast that makes color pop, beautiful viewing angles. And there really is nothing better out there. Companies like LG, Samsung, and Sony make the very best models. If the budget permits and you just want to go right to the head of the line in terms of what it is, what is the best thing I could buy right now? That's the short story for that. Now, if you want to save a little How bit of money. How much budget are you talking about there? Like, what, what is the average price of those? It depends on the screen size. Say for a typical 55-inch screen, you're talking about $1,500, maybe a little bit cheaper when it really gets down to the Black Friday pricing, on up to a solid five figures if you want to go all the way up to, say, the 90-plus <laughs> right, right. inch screen sizes, <laughs> which are now available, which is kind of crazy. That is right. something to keep in mind. Let's bring and it back down to earth then. <laughs> they are beautiful screens, though. In terms of eye candy, that's where you yeah. go. Oh, do However, I have to? Do I have to not send you that ninety-inch screen, Tom? That's what it was. It was going to be your. I mean, if you're going to buy it, I'm not going to turn yeah, it down. Yeah, I just you know you might have to tear it on a wall or two. <laughs> now, for good value at good prices, LCD is still the 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 workhorse of the TV industry. And I was helping a friend shop for a sub five hundred dollar fifty five inch TV recently. We came across a wonderful LG that was available at local at our local Costco, uh, the R8000. This is a it turned out to be a fantastically reviewed unit for currently at about three hundred fifty dollars, uh, which is a wonderful price for that kind of a four K screen at that at that price point. It, it fit their budget and their needs perfectly. However, if you had a little bit more money to spend, something closer to that five hundred dollar budget, or maybe just slightly above, Hisense and TCL are the ones I love the most. Hisense in terms of their U K, that's literally their flagship. That is competitive with even the very best LCDs out there today. They also have a step down version, the U6, which is almost as good, uh, and it will still provide that bright, punchy picture. And likewise with TCL, they have the QM8, which is just fantastic. I had previewed this at CES last January. 
it is an amazingly bright and detailed display with wicked contrast. I mean, just very, very good. And then they also have a step down version called the Q7 that provides good value in terms of picture performance and screen size options. Again, up into up to 90 plus inches if you really need something supersized. And now with Google TV operating system on these listings here, which is interesting to see that are. instead of Roku more often. That is that is a choice. Uh, granted, it, generally speaking, the more expensive TVs usually have better processors built into them, and they will provide a better app experience overall. I think Google TV is an okay app experience. I think Samsung's uh, version of their Tizen operating system for their TVs is an okay option. I think LG does a pretty good job with their WebOS option for that built-in app experience as well. And we'll get into some additional streaming options here in a second. But one thing I wanted to mention is with all of these flat panel TVs is that the need for a good audio experience, period. Uh, sound bars are the simple way to do it. Be honest. They're very popular and they're very easy to do. And a couple companies that are really worth mentioning are the, the ones I love the most. And number one, I would put up there is uh, Sonos in particular. I have done work for Sonos in the past and I have given them lots of critical feedback on their products. That is just one of the easiest to use setups I've I've enjoyed. I love the sound quality. It's it's not exactly the cheapest option out there, but what you pay for, you I think you really get a good value in terms of just audio performance, room correction features if you're an iOS mm. user, and other features like that. That just uh, I love the products in general. However, if you want to save a little money and you just need something to help your current TV sound better, period. Roku, of all people, makes a wonderful streaming bar. Uh, they're Stream Bar Pro products. Uh, good prices, good performance for what it is, and it integrates their streaming products, which are fantastic. And it, it's uh, available at even very, very affordable pricing. That's a, also a Stream Bar, or I should say a Sound Bar product. I would even be comfortable using outdoors just for temporary use or semi-permanent anyway. Mm. Now, if the budget is really kind of like, okay, I want the absolute best. What is the craziest thing I could buy right now that's going to drive a large room? Check out Nakamichi and what they're doing with the Nakamichi Dragon. This is a custom-made system. They make a few of these every month, and they are well-reviewed. Uh, everyone seems to love them who gets their ears on them. It, it, it's kind of the ultimate high end. If, if you were going to spend something similar with Sonos, you'd be buying a pretty big kit. Uh, Nakamichi is kind of doing that all in one with that particular product. And it's just uh, 3800 bucks is a lot, but it's not, you know, it's not sky high really. No. And it incorporates wireless quote unquote products. Generally you have to plug these into a wall somewhere, but you don't need to connect them with individual wires for mm. transmitting the sound mm -hmm. to each speaker, which is really nice. Now, likewise, I was talking about streaming products. Uh, there are really only two that I recommend, and one would be Roku and their streaming products. Uh, the Roku Express 4K Plus is my low-cost recommendation. They have an Express version, just regular, that isn't the 4K Plus. I do not recommend that one. The 4K Plus adds an actual power button and a volume control, which the regular and, granted, cheaper Express version mm -hmm. doesn't. And if you're trying to just have that all-in-one experience where it's like, hey, I don't want to use two remotes at the same time, stick with that 4K+. Plus. That's a great way to do an inexpensive upgrade on a TV you may already have, and you just want to make sure that it's going to provide a good streaming experience with any service currently available. Now, likewise, if you are an Apple user, iOS user, and that is your product, the Apple TV 4K, 4K Plus in particular, uh, is, or I think it's just the 4K, that is the one to get. If you already are in the Apple ecosystem, stick with that product, and it is something that you will just learn. It'll integrate seamlessly with everything you use. It provides terrific performance. It, it is built like a tank. It'll last for years, and it's it's right up there with any of the very best streaming products currently. And they're not huge anymore either. They're they're getting to be hockey puck size. They're not as small as the Roku Express, of course, but you know they're totally. Not, yeah, they're yeah, and it's, it, they they hide pretty well on a, a, a small console or or even behind the I've, TV itself. I've been purchasing a bunch of these products recently. I helped a relative uh, basically ditch 
cable television service. Their bill was over 300 bucks a month for cable and internet service. And they were paying for hardware they no longer even had. And there's a mm. tip. If I could just give one is take a look at your bills. If, you, if you're a long time cable or satellite subscriber, you'd be surprised at what they've been billing you for over the years. And they will never tell you. It's like, oh, by the way, you don't need this anymore. Or here's a better option for less money. They'll never do that. And that's just something to keep in mind when you do that. Also, for any of the TVs I just mentioned, they're all internet enabled. If you didn't, if you absolutely wanted a dumb TV, you don't want a smart TV, you could just not connect them to the internet and say no to any of the terms and agreements that you have to click through in order to fire these TVs up. But for ease of use, have it connect to the TV or have it connect to your internet service automatically and do all those upgrades and firmware updates automatically. And that will make it so that every time you turn it on, the apps are ready to go. The TV is less buggy than it may have been when it first shipped. And I think for any product out there, even things like your streaming products, they provide regular updates as well. And it's good just to keep that kind of stuff updated. And, and finally, when you're shopping through the holiday season with either Black Friday coming up or any throughout the rest of the year, just realize that uh, this is a good time to take a look at what the cheapest prices will be and realize those prices will come around again before soon if you can't buy right now. And services like Amazon necessarily do not have the lowest prices that mm -hmm. you're going to find. And do check other sources. Uh, specific, it doesn't even matter what the product category is. I was shopping for Chromebooks recently, and I realized that Best Buy had much better pricing for some of the devices I was looking for than Amazon or anyone else. And uh, the same could be said for something like Walmart. Uh, Amazon isn't the be-all, end-all. They're convenient as can be, no doubt. But look around when you're going to make the decision on what to buy. And then your sources like Costco, too, or your your subscription or membership clubs, those things are wonderful for a reason in their own way. And they provide yeah, either. It sounds like it, it makes a lot of sense to figure out the model you want, then do a little price comparison rather than just see totally. what one place like Amazon is going to offer you as their Black Friday deal. I agree 100%. And I'm always looking for like, what's my favorite TV of the year? What will be the lowest price on that? And when? And if right now through the holiday season isn't really going to do it for you, I'm thinking TV specific. Think about when, say, like the Super Bowl rolls, rolls around in February. I guarantee you there'll be another big sale and it will match very closely what the current price is. Don't ever feel like you're you have to do it now. There's not going to be another opportunity again at this yeah. price point. It will <laughs> always come around again. Don't don't fall for the panic. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Take your time and get what you want and and, and save some money. Don't pay full price. Wow. Well, thank you, Robert. Uh, these are fantastic tips uh, and good day, Internet folks. Stick around. You're going to get some more. But before that, let's check out the mailbag. This one comes in from Allison Sheridan, who was on the show last week. Uh, she mentions on Thursday's episode of DTNS, she says, y'all talked about Apple finally jumping on the bandwagon with RCS. Tom made the point that all of the carriers support RCS. Allison says, what I'd like to add... It wasn't until very recently that all three of the big carriers had full support for the advanced features in RCS. For example, AT&T didn't switch to RCS for its default Android messaging until just a few months ago in June of this year. Yeah, I think a lot of people will probably notice this uh, same thing that Allison pointed out. It's not exactly right that AT&T didn't switch to RCS uh, for Android. It supported RCS on Android as far back as 2015. But what Allison said that that's a good point is full featured and particularly the date, June of 2023, is when AT&T switched to supporting Google's messages implementation of RCS, which is the one that gave you all the features, including end-to-end -end encryption and everything. So uh, they've supported RCS for, for uh, a long time, for eight years now, uh, but they didn't they was kind of slowly bringing along the features and expanding the support. And it really wasn't until Google started pushing it in its default messaging app that that everybody kind of collapsed into saying, okay, we're going to support it on this one default app uh, for, for everything. So it's, yes, they've supported RCS for a long time, but Allison makes a good point that it's only recently that it became easy to be able to take advantage of RCS on Android. 
Well, thanks to Allison for the mailbag, and thanks to everybody who emails us and gives us feedback in a variety of different ways. I uh, really appreciate it. We also appreciate you, Robert Heron. Uh, this, this is, even though I'm not really in the market for a TV, I want to be. Uh, it's just my favorite conversation ever. So, so thanks I for bringing some knowledge and giving uh, people some gift ideas. Where can they find out more about what you do? You can check out my website, heronfidelity.com. And I'm also on Twitter occasionally and also Blue Sky. I've started using that more and more, oh, nice. I find. And I like that a lot. And so I'm available. Ping me. Shoot me an email. Contact me however. <laughs> I'm easy. Fantastic. <laughs> Patrons, stick around. We're going to talk to more uh, with Robert Heron about home theater recommendations. we got some projectors to talk about, stuff like that. Stick around for that. Just a reminder, we do the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we're back tomorrow, and we're going to be live again with Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>